From David O. McKay, love is the divinest attribute of the human soul. There is no difficulty, there is no sorrow, there is no wealth, there is nothing in the world that can separate two hearts that are bound by the golden clasp of love. From Psalms 24, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. From Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, life is so arranged that morality and happiness go hand in hand. Immorality doesn't work. It doesn't pay off. It does not lighten the burden of living. It increases it. Sex is too powerful, too profound too much an elemental force to be taken lightly or casually. It's like nitroglycerin, useful as long as it is protected and safeguarded, deadly if mishandled or abused. From university researcher Dr. Ray Short, young people who have premarital sex are more likely to break up with their dating partners, have problems after marrying, get involved in extramarital affairs, and get divorced. Not only can premarital sex ruin romance, it can wreck marriage. From Mother Teresa, recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. Virginity is a lovely thing. It is the greatest gift a man and woman can give to one another. A husband and wife who consummate their marriage on their wedding night will grow in love for each other.
Whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. The gift of love that I would hope to receive, pure and from me alone, that is the gift I will save for you. Landers. I'm 17 and already my life is messed up. Ted and I went steady for about six months and we began to do things we had no right to do. I got pregnant. We both quit school and got married right away. My folks thought it would be best if we moved out of town. So we did. I despise my life and what I've done to Ted. The baby cries all the time and gets on Ted's nerves. He drinks too much and I can't blame him. We live in a dump, and there's no money for sitters or movies or decent clothes. Well, Ted never says anything, but I know he must hate me because I got him into this. I'm afraid he hates the baby, too. He never pays attention to her. There are times when I think this is just a bad dream, and I'll wake up at home, get dressed, and go to school with the kids I like so much but I know too well that those days are over for me, and I'm stuck. I'm not writing for advice. It's too late for that. I'm just writing in the hope that you will print this letter for the benefit of other teenagers who think they know it all, like I did. Signed, Wrecked at 17. Help Wanted. Full-time job. Hours? 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for a minimum of 18 years. No time off for weekends or holidays. You cannot quit. Duties. Assume all physical, moral, and financial responsibilities of another human being. Qualifications. Patience, compassion, understanding, and mature judgment. Salary. None. In fact, you must plan on spending at least $3,500 a year for the privilege of taking this job. I am only 16, and I'm not ready to take the job described above. Life is too short to be tied down with the baby when I could be out having fun. Sign me, not ready. There's someone else I've got to take care of first. to be smart she's going to be wise when you look in her eyes you will know that she's red and she's smart and she's got her own mind she's going to be strong she's going to be tough she'll be made of the stuff that will last through the trials and the pains and the rain Give her time, it's her turn now. Take your time, little baby, it's your mother's turn now. It's your mother's turn now. Hush, little baby, don't you cry. Mama's gonna kiss. If that mama is a baby too 
to be good, she's going to be kind, and you'll find she will know where to go. And you will not get lost if you walk beside her. She's going to be fun, she's going to be free, she's not going to live in the past, cause she grew up too fast, left her dreams behind her. I'm creating somebody wonderful, I'm creating somebody great, I'm thrilled that I'm Building a beautiful person, my baby's mother, my baby's mother, my baby's mother, that's me. Atlanta. A federal health official said yesterday that between 50,000 and 80,000 young women are made sterile by gonorrhea every year. Tens of millions of Americans now have genital herpes, a disease for which there is no present cure. Women who become sexually active as teenagers, or have more than one partner, or whose partner has had a number of partners, run a much higher risk than usual of getting cervical cancer. The existence of ever-increasing and deadly sexually transmitted diseases makes the answer to sexual behavior a simple one. A committed, exclusive relationship with one partner. Dear Abby, thank you for that letter in your column warning kids about VD. I wish I'd seen something like that when I was 14. I'm a 16-year-old girl who just underwent a very painful, very serious operation as a result of gonorrhea. I had to have a hysterectomy. Abby, I don't sleep around. I have only one boyfriend, but I also have a very ugly seven-inch scar running down my stomach. The worst part is knowing that I will never in my life be able to bear my own children. Signed, paid a high price. Fire warms, fire burns. Dora Jean was cold and she was waiting for the flame she heard was warm for her. Dora Jean was hoping for the love she knew. Joe came smiling down the road and made her think the sun had risen. Fire in his hands and on his lips, and Laura knew that she was his. Staring at the ashes of the life she used to know. Scarred and scared, she wondered how she let such precious things be thrown away. All she wanted was someone to walk and talk with and to listen to.
I am a 15-year-old boy who was dumb enough to mix booze and pot. As far as I am concerned, they add up to sex. I ended up going to bed with a girl I liked only as a friend. The girl I really care about lives in another state. She heard about it, and I lost her forever. I also lost the friendship of the girl I went to bed with. When she sees me, she ducks around the corner because she's ashamed of what happened. I'm ashamed too, and I feel dirty. I would like to explain this to her, but no way now, I guess. Sign me, blew it. Dear Jim, last night you pleaded with me so ardently and urgently to prove my love for you. You were very persuasive. And because I always want to please you and do what you want me to do, it was hard to deny you. Today I am thankful from the bottom of a frightened and full heart that I did not let you persuade me. If I had agreed to your insistence, I would now be despising myself and hating and blaming you. I have hardly slept during the night, but I have thought a lot. I kept thinking what a shining and beautiful word the word purity is. Today I do not believe that I could bear the despair and self-disgust that I would have felt if I had given in to you. Jim, I know that I will always think a lot of you, but now I feel that I cannot safely trust in you. Last night you were trying to destroy my purity and self-respect and chance of true future happiness for a few minutes of excitement and pleasure for yourself. Your talk of my proving my love for you was a bitter mockery. You prove that you do not love me. You only love yourself. Elizabeth. From Margaret Anderson, American publisher. In real love, you want the other person's good. In romantic love, you want the other person. future holds for us. Let us have a relationship that will leave us only good memories and a good conscience. Let us remember the Lord's request. Love one another as I have loved you. Let us love not only as mortals love, but as God loves. Proverbs 23 and 7. As a man thinketh in his heart, 
so is he. From the Reverend Billy Graham, all transgression begins with sinful thinking. You who have come to Christ for a pure heart, guard against the pictures of lewdness and sensuality which Satan flashes upon the screen of your imaginations. Select with care the books that you read. Choose discerningly the kind of entertainment in which you place yourself. You should no more allow sinful imaginations to accumulate in your mind and soul than you would let garbage collect in your living room. Matthew 5 and 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Dear Father, casual sex is more common than I ever imagined it would be here on campus. Well, the pressure to throw out one's moral standards comes not only from the guys, but also from the open-minded girls who frequently only accept you if you've gone all the way. They make it all sound so, so natural and so inevitable that there are times when I wonder what I'm waiting for. My dear daughter, I think I can tell you in six words what you're waiting for. You're waiting to be free. Free from that nagging voice of conscience and that gray shadow of guilt. Free to give all of yourself, not a panicky fraction. I know you pretty well, and I know that that fastidious and perfectionist part of you has always wanted the very best, not second best. That's what makes you such a wonderful person. And that's why you're holding out. Something in you, some deep instinct knows what a tremendous experience that first complete union with another person can be. And that same instinct keeps telling you, do not blur it, not to waste it, not make it small. Yeah. 
from Ann Landers. Dear friends, I have never received a letter from a girl who said she was sorry she saved herself from marriage, but I've received hundreds from those who didn't and were heartsick. How can you tell infatuation from love? Infatuation is instant desire. It's one set of glands calling to another. Love is a friendship that has caught fire. It takes root and it grows one day at a time. Infatuation is marked by a feeling of insecurity. You are excited and eager, but not genuinely happy. There are nagging doubts, unanswered questions, little bits and pieces about your beloved that you would just as soon not examine too closely. It might spoil the dream. Love is the quiet understanding and the mature acceptance of imperfection. It is real. It gives you strength and grows beyond you to lift you both. You were warmed by his presence, even when he's away. Miles don't separate you. You want him near, but near or far, you know he's yours, and you can wait. Infatuation says, we must get married right away. I can't risk losing her. Love says, be patient. Don't panic. He is yours. Plan your future with confidence. Love means trust. You are calm, secure, and unthreatened. He feels that trust, and it makes him even more trustworthy. Love is the maturation of friendship. You must be friends before you can be lovers. Love is an upper. It makes you look up. It makes you think up. It makes you a better person than you were before. Soon after he was married, Thomas Moore, the famous 19th century Irish poet, was called away on a business trip. Upon his return, he was met at the door not by his beautiful bride, but by the family doctor. Your wife is upstairs, said the doctor, but she has asked that you do not come up. And then Moore learned the terrible truth. His wife had contracted smallpox. The disease had left her once flawless skin pocked and terribly scarred. She had taken one look at her disfigured reflection in the mirror and commanded that the shutters be drawn and that her husband never see her again. Moore would not listen. He ran upstairs and threw open the door of his wife's room. It was black as night inside. Not a sound came from the darkness. Groping along the wall, Moore felt for the gas jet to light the lamps. A startled cry came from a black corner of the room. No, no, don't light the lamps. Moore hesitated, swayed by the pleading in the voice. Go, she begged. Please go. This is the greatest gift I can give you now. Moore did go. He went down to his study where he sat up most of the night, prayerfully writing. Not a poem this time, but a song. He had never written a song before, but now he found it more natural to his mood than simple poetry. He not only wrote the words, he wrote the music too, and the next morning, as soon as the sun was up, he returned to his wife's room. He felt his way to a chair and sat down. Are you awake, he asked. I am, came a voice from the far side of the room, but you must not ask to see me. You must not press me, Thomas. I will sing to you then, he answered. And so for the first time, Thomas Moore sang to his wife the song that still lives today.
the song ended. As his voice trailed off on the last note, Moore heard his bride rise. She crossed the room to the window, reached up, and slowly drew open the shutters. Their first touch at 17 was in the park and the moon was full she was beautiful to him and her hair was long and her eyes were blue and her skin was warm and she turned to him and he thought that he knew what love was another touch at 22 on their wedding night and the stars were bright she was beautiful to him and her hair smelled sweet and her lips were full and her skin was warm and she turned to him and he thought that he knew what love was And then again, at 25, when the baby came And the sun was high She was beautiful to him And her hair was damp, and her fingers shook And her skin was warm, and she turned to him And he thought that he knew what love was Later on, at 54, sitting on the porch, all the children gone, she was beautiful to him, and her hair was gray, and her forehead lined, and her skin was warm, and she turned to him, and he thought that he knew what love was. Their last touch at 85 was by her bed And the moon was full, she was beautiful to him And her hair was thin and her eyes were closed And her skin was cold and she turned to him And he knew that he knew what love was. After 68 years of laughter and tears, he knew that he knew what love was. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to weep, and a time to laugh. A time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to love. Seasons run. 